what is the historical significance of this site? And the historical significance, I think, is this, that virtually it's a microcosm of the whole history of Iceland. We have evidence of the first settlement, the first houses, the first graveyards, cremation graves, inhumation graves, church, and we can see the whole development of the country in this one site. That's very unusual. A saga is a prose narrative tale from Iceland. All the sagas are Icelandic, and the family sagas, the one we're using, are about small farmers, small chieftains, and their feuds. Our archaeology sits within a controversy. Within the controversy, the issue has been how to use the sources. And Icelandic archaeologists have tended, not all, have tended not to turn to these texts and to rather ignore them. There's a bit of a conflict within Icelandic archaeologists, archaeology, and um, Jesse is, is on the side that believes that the sagas, at least in part, represent actual people and actual places. Um, and there are people on the other side that think they're just stories. Personally, I don't believe that you know, the details of the events described actually happened and probably not a lot of the events described, even the big events, did not happen. What we're doing is a major excavation that is using these texts from the start to see if perhaps they can cast a better light on the material culture. Well, you see, the strange paradox about the Icelandic people is that we are all brought up <coughs> Uh, with the view that the sagas are not just literature but uh, historical accounts. We've used the text also to find our site and with these texts in hand they're somewhat like a treasure map and they've led us to the site. A place mm, isn't a place or an, isn't interesting un until it has a story connected to it. Uh, that's what you're looking for I suppose. Uh, I, I, I think what you find is that, that the, the, the stories give a meaning to the landscape. Yeah. So in fact, if one wants to understand the landscape of the country over a period of time, mm -hmm. that these stories which are in the sagas take us back a thousand years, so of course it's important. Mm -hmm. Also, an archaeologist doesn't want to waste time digging just in any hole in any field. You want to find mm -hmm. something yeah. that then you can connect to the culture and the society. Mm -hmm. Iceland was discovered as an uninhabited island in the ninth century. That's in the early part of the Viking Age. Within decades, a migration, the first major migration of Europeans west across the Atlantic started, and 10 to 20,000 people got into small ships and sailed out to Iceland looking for land, looking for a new life. What we have found at Hrisbru in the Mosva Valley is the home of a major chieftain's family and one of the reasons we've gone to this site is that the site is mentioned in six of the Icelandic historical and saga writings. You haven't seen the house. If you come over here you can sort of see. As you enter you can either go right into a side room, a gable room, or left into the main hall. You sort of steps down a little bit, they dug it in, and you see the, the dark black layer on top of the raised, that's the, the benches. These small stones are the inside of the wall. On the outsides, there's turf, and then the far outside, there's this line of larger stones. So this is a long hall, and there's a long, outdoor, a long fire in the middle. It's hard to estimate how many people lived there, at least 20 and perhaps more. Life was somewhat cramped in this building and yet for the period, for the time, it's a large, magnificent building. This season we've focused mostly on the internal features of this Viking Age longhouse. The key to understanding how space was used in the building is in the minute residues, the organic residues and the minute artifacts that are embedded in the floors. 
sometimes the artifact distribution doesn't tell you exactly how the building was used. So I'm hoping that the sediment analysis will be some use. All of the floor layers from the house get collected into buckets based on a one meter grid and brought back here to me where I float them. These floor surfaces are covered in all the black, greasy grime that gets packed into the floor where people were walking on and living on. So all of the charcoal, all of the bones from the fires, uh, things they were eating, stuff that they just dropped, all gets packed into these floors, which is why it's critical that we take such care with them. We can help determine where people are actually, actually building in this area, in this valley. It is a glass bead coat with gold foil, I think. And I found it when I was doing flotation. We have a number of, unusually high number of, of glass beads found. I think we're up in the, in the 30s now, the number of beads, which I understand is more than have been found in any other longhouse thus far in, in Iceland. It's a typical 10th century Viking Age bead. Segmented? It's called double segmented bead. I think it's silver foil on the inside. It's made with uh, wound glass, but with a coating of silver foil on the inside of it. A very interesting find object from, uh, from this site is the beads. And the interesting part is that we have so many from one single house. There's more than 20 beads from the house. This year, what is Rather extraordinary are the number of beads, high status beads, some with small gold around them, others with uh, design, and how many of them we find in the house. That means that people uh, who are essentially of a rich social level were losing material. And among the, the ones they search for, we find the ones they didn't find. This is supposed to be, if we believe the sagas at all, a house of a very important chieftain and the material finds of all these beads and these goods points to the fact this is exactly what we have come across. Wow! <laughs> One of the larger objects that we found was a millstone or a grinding stone. And from this we can see that the stories that we, we read in the sagas about importing grain and brewing and providing things for feasts and uh, high status goods had to be true. This is very similar to a millstone that we found at Risbro. Yeah, this is, a, uh, this is a millstone from an Icelandic lava rock. You haven't seen our stone yet, but no, the stone is it's, it's, in, it's in wonderful shape. My guess is it broke before it was used very much. It's very thick. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit bigger than this, mm -hmm. and um, it looks like it's rather new, And but there's a piece that's broken on the bottom. From the perspective of the finds, we have, in comparison to, to other settlement sites, uh, up until now, actually a large amount of what would be considered high-status materials that were imported from, from Europe, such as glass beads, particularly. And there's just this year four glass beads, rather large, that were decorated with sort of eyes on the side of them that, you know, based on our preliminary research, may have actually been from South Asia. It was uh, a wealthier family that lived here. They probably had many attached servants and probably also slaves. We, we may get insight into that powerful class of chieftains that were living in this, on this site in you know, the 10th and 11th century. It's a six by three meter church, two architectural parts, a nave and a chancel. The chancel was two by two, the nave is four by three. It was surrounded by about 20 burials. Uh, some of them were reburials. At least one was buried underneath the altar and exhumed after the church was abandoned. You see this right here? It's a surface, and it may be the surface of a grave. It sounds so, Suzanne. 
in the churchyard where we'll be looking for uh, uh, pits intruding into it that would be grave pits. This is part of a graveyard um, associated with the church that was over at this part of the site. And in previous seasons, uh, we found graves. There, were that, there was one right in this area that's been backfilled, and um, we, there was another that was emptied earlier. And just last week, we found one right here. The first burial we uncovered had, was a homicide victim, a person who had an ax wound in the side of his head uh, that would have been immediately fatal. It went, would have cut through all sorts of blood vessels, and then the back of his head was chopped off. People talk about violence in the sagas, and we have evidence that the people during saga times were violent. In uh, Ale Saga, it says that that when this church was taken down, that then burials were moved from here to Mosfell, from Reesbrew to Mosfell, and so that was one of the uh, one of the things that we wanted to explore. And there's a few cases where it's pretty clear that there are empty graves that were emptied. I think that it was. Uh, common practice in the time period that we're working in to actually um, remove the remains of an individual years after they've been buried and put them in another place. So it's possible that that was the situation here. These reburials, we think that it's possible that those are uh, pagan burials that were buried in pagan graves and then t taken to the uh, church and reburied and there were under certain conditions, a person could be, come, uh, be posthumously converted to Christianity, kind of like the Mormons in the United States. And under altar is them under the altar, thou fund this manabane, men's bones were found. Thou vor a miklameri o anar manabane, and they were much larger than the bones of other men. Thickest men thavita ath so gamat mana, and men think they understand from the speech of older men, ath munti vera hava bane ales, that these were the bones of ale. And these bones were then moved from the empty shaft, according to the saga. It looks like it's what has happened at Hreesbrews, um, matching pretty closely with, uh, with what we are told in the sagas. Crucial for our excavation has been the saga description in Eil Saga. Eilat Skatla Grimson was one of the great warrior poets of Iceland, and there's a whole saga devoted to him. At the end of his life, he was buried at Hrisbru in the Mosva Valley. And they had was here in his, in his old age. They found a tomb here that might have been actually contained Eil himself. For us who are born up, brought up uh, with uh, reading the sagas and uh, treating them as uh, the final truth about the people who lived here in Iceland. Uh, it's of course fascinating. If they ever do you find anything yeah. related to Ail Scott the Grimson, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, that'll be something. Under the altar at the church at Hrisbru, where we have found an empty grave, one that was completely empty during the medieval period, and the saga told us that Eil had originally been buried under the altar and that his grave was moved. It's an interesting indication that perhaps there might be some truth in this saga. Eil's saga um, helps in that it says that there was a, a church at Hrisbru which was moved to Mosfet and that the bodies that were buried there were um, taken out of the ground after the land was um, deconsecrated and then moved over to the other church. The question is often asked, did A it really live? Uh, it's something I can't answer, but logically, one thinks about it. Did the Icelanders, just several generations early, need to invent 
a man who was a Viking, who lived in Iceland, who came from a Norwegian family, who went abroad, who killed people, who made poetry. In other words, it all fits in the society. There's no way we're ever going to guarantee this man existed, but his story is very plausible. Where do you think we are now, given the, the excavations that are underway? Have we come to a point where we can reassess somewhat the sagas? I don't expect archaeology to, to prove incidents in the sagas. Uh, scholars used to believe in the sagas prior to, say, 1950, and then it all changed. What's happening now is very important for our um, understanding of the family sagas. All these excavations will help us understand them in a better way. How much of the sagas is true, I don't know. Uh... But this, despite th this fictionality, what, uh, at least in, in part of the sagas, uh, I don't think archaeology has ever contradicted the general image of uh, the history and the society of Iceland that is that you can read from from these sagas, and that, and that is very interesting. If the the uh, sort of ar archaeological findings do not contradict uh, what the, the sagas tell us, then that's confirmation or or, or, or lack of disconfirmation of, of what they say. I think you should use all the, all the information and all the, all the references you can find. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't throw out the sagas just because they are sagas. <laughs> but we, I wouldn't use it for, for identifying remains or, or, or linking it to, to one you know, named person. We always have to be careful also to treat archaeological excavation and the sagas as different data sets. The big question, the big sort of task for us is, is how to use all the, the data sets together. I mean, the way I, the way I see it is that they're not completely separate, but the, they deal with different materials, obviously. But if it's like any other problem you're trying to solve, if you only look at half the pieces, you're not getting, you're cheating yourself. So, you know, it's like trying to run a race or trying to solve a puzzle with one eye shut. In Iceland, the archaeology, we try to separate the written sources from the, uh, the excavations, but we can't because there are so much written sources in this. Excavations has proven that there are, we, we should take more notice of the sagas because there are things in that we have found here that can only be described in the stars. We have worked from the start with the people, with the farm, with the town, and with the National Museum, and in many ways it's a model of how to integrate a project into the social fabric of a society. One of the things that we came across was a series of plates, most of them either Danish or British manufacture from the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and these were obviously buried at some time by the same family that still owns the land. This brought us into a a nice discussion with the family, with the people who live on the farm, who see their history, even their most recent history, involved in the excavation. <laughs> Maybe it was some kids that, had pl that were playing, you said, and knocked down the shelf, and then they were hiding the stuff. <laughs> That's a good theory. And all the bottles. Yeah. It's like, oh shit. <laughs> Before mom gets home, you know, her favorite dish, throw it in the trench up in the tomb. It's a project that sits right in the cultural and historical consciousness of this country. The soul, the character of, of, of the nation was found in the individuals who are in the sagas, the heroes, 
the villains, the women, the men, how they got together and, and how, how their lives ran. The Viking times and the heroes from the past have always been uh, cherished very much. Family saga, so-called, have been of um, immense importance to the Icelandic nation, especially during the fight for independence from the Danes. We're into the research, but we're also into giving something back. Whenever we as archaeologists dig a hole in the ground, somebody's going to be interested in what comes out. And I believe that's the case anywhere you dig a hole in the world. And I, I think it's important that, that we understand that, that we're not the only stakeholders. They're going to want to digest that material in their own way, present it in their own way, and, and use it for whatever, cultural tourism, for understanding the past, for, for identity, whatever. I held that them, I still think they take me back to Mr. Sauer, or Charles had true a market of Isma, Isam Stantor, or Hedna, see held the ask what I still think would take me a market of the Gamma theater, or a coma from Isona Ransok, the Menso, and so, and when I get out his pronuna, Eka sem steður þá við það sem að, að Íslendingu á sögurnar er að, er að segja og, 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 hérna, og að það svona, já, ég hugsa að, ég hugsa að hérna, þetta svona styrki svona sjálfsmyndir að í, að okkar í, í þessu samingi. Fordleifa uppgreftur sem þessi og við svo eru landi það styrkir rætur okkar vegna þess að það er verið að grafa upp það sem að við höfum lesið um í sögunum. Og það sem að, að já, það styrkir sjálfsímin þjóðarinnar og allt það sem að liggur að baki í sögunum að, að þetta skuli finnast. Sko, Íslendingar eru náttúrulega, þetta er lítil þjóð, eh, 300 og eitthvað þúsund manns, þeir gerir nú ekki mikið í hinu, hinu alþjóðlega samengi en Ég held að sko, flestir Íslendingar séu mér stoltir að því og glaðir yfir því að vera Íslendingar. Og, og þeim þykir, hérna, þykir e, flestum hverju mjög og hafa mikinn áhuga á, á sko, því sem að hefur verið að gerast á, á, á Íslandi í gegnum aldirnar. Þetta styrkir sjálfsýmin þjóðarinnar og þessa sterku ákveðnu þjóð sem að getur lesið í landinu sínu. Söguna. Þetta er mikilvægt, þetta er jafn mikilvægt fyrir íslensku þjóðina og sjálfs ímynd hennar eins og fornminjar á Gríklandi fyrir grísku þjóðina og söguna. Það er, það er akkurat það sama. Uh, I think I was only 11 or 12 when I finally realized that the people <coughs> that my grandfather and grandmother and their friends were always talking about had died about a thousand years ago because uh, they were such a living part uh, of the community as people were referring to what they did and where they lived and what had happened to them and so on and so forth. So the sagas have that kind of similar role for us as the place of Shakespeare or the Old Testament have for the English uh, or for the Jews. So this is like when, um, when archaeology and, and in Iceland it does something very, you know, um, important. It comes into the dialogue of this. Is the saga true or is it untrue? Where does our identity lie? I'm very pleased with the with the findings made by Jesse because they show, I think he's actually found bones that were probably taken up and moved in, into the church or close to the church, probably from pagan burials and, and so on. So he, he confirms that. He confirms that there was a uh, I'm not sure about the, the place under the altar, whether it was under the altar, but at least, uh, and he confirms that there was a church there, but none of that, to my mind, uh, uh, diminishes my belief in the fact that the whoever was writing that was making a point. The debate about the saga sort of, for me, hinges on sort of two related concepts also. The, uh, the orality of the sagas and the historicity of the sagas. They're actually two different things and one depends on the other. So the historicity depends on them being oral. The same sort of farmers were living on the same sort of land, practicing the same sort of agriculture in basically the same sort of society. Whether the sagas have historical accuracy or not has been a debate that has gone on for almost a century 
Normally, it's a debate among scholars. My opinion is this, yes, no, forever, goes on. What we're trying to do is bring in archaeology into this, bring in a real material culture, 